Good evening. I'm uh, Dr. Alan Brenner. I'm uh, Deputy Director of the Centre for Ethics and Law at uh, UCL's Law Faculty and welcome this evening uh, to our uh, wonderful Moot Court, which um, uh, as the name suggests, we use for uh, our mock trials, our moots, as well as the lecture theatre. Uh, I'm delighted, delighted to uh, welcome uh, 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 Raphael, uh, Professor Raphael um, Almagor Cohen, uh, to um, uh, present his book and uh, his his uh, research. Uh, I uh, have a, an apology to make um, that. Uh, uh, shortly before uh, coming here, uh, the person who was going to chair this, uh, Catherine, Dr. Catherine Urquhart, um, unfortunately, for personal reasons, um, uh, couldn't attend, so you've got me instead. <laughs> uh, I will um, hand over uh, to uh, Raphael in a, in a moment, uh, just to say that um, I've got comments from Catherine, which is kind of uh, sent to me. So I'll at the end go through um, Catherine's uh, uh, comments on uh, uh, on Raphael's book, and uh, then uh, open up to discussion from the floor. But uh, over to you, Raphael, to present your book. Thank you very much. First of all, I want to thank Helen for the kind invitation. And uh, Alan was very instrumental uh, in writing this book uh, because he is the one who actually enabled the writing of this book. So I, I need to thank him greatly. Uh, and I'll explain later. Uh, so this is uh, just one thing that he has done uh, for my scholarship. It's not the only thing, but uh, many things. So I, I'm deeply grateful, Alan. Thank you very much. And thank you for coming and to, to, to listen about, uh, about this about this new book of mine that was published a few months ago. So let me explain uh, what happened and uh, uh, what I tried to do. Let me see if I can operate this clear. Okay. So the book is about really multiculturalism. Um, multiculturalism is a phenomenon that studies uh, cultures in, in um, democracies. Um, and uh, we are talking about plenty more than one culture within a society. There's no one homogeneous society. All societies are composed of all kinds of plurality of, uh, of cultures. And uh, multiculturalism is a field of study that grew up in the 1960s in Europe that sees individuals as part of a chain, that there's history behind them, that there is past, present, future, and we cannot disconnect from the culture to which we are born. Culture is extremely important to us. And our identity is shaped by the culture that we belong to, to which we, we were born to. It is impossible to understand and to analyze social life and to talk about human identity without speaking about culture or without speaking about religion because they're extremely important. Uh, we cannot divorce ourselves from this. We have to try very hard and there's no reason for us to, to do that. Um, therefore, the basic concept of social analysis should include not only in the individual as liberals claim, but also group. Uh, so, and then there's sort of a clash between the individual rights and group rights. What comes first and how you reconcile when there's a conflict between the two. Because in liberalism, everything stems from the individual, everything returns back to individual. But what you do, if there are some people who say that we have also to take care of cultural groups or group rights, and there is some sort of contrast or conflict between the two. Of all the values, I've studied all the values. I'm a political philosopher, a political theorist, so I've studied uh, the ideologies from Aristotle and Plato until nowadays. Uh, and different philosophers propose different values as the most important. Some people say that the most important value is liberty. Other claims that the most important value is equality. Other people said the most important value is truth. Other ones says that it's tolerance. Um, I'm in the group that believe that the most important value is justice. That if you're uh, able to well, understand what is, what is justice and you accept what is justice, and then you apply it and ipso facto all other uh, values will be answered for. 
Justice means fairness in the distribution of resources, in equal treatment and equal application of the law. So I was dealing with the issue of culture for a number of years. I, studied, I started to study culture, multiculturalism back in 1993. Um, I belong to a group that studied the uh, influence of the Middle East on, on Europe and the influences of Europe on the Middle East. And I've published a series of articles throughout the years about different facets and different interests of culture. Uh, but um, it was 2011 that prompted me to say, okay, it's time for me to write a book. It's going to amalgamate all my scholarship. And the result of this, is this book that uh, came out in 2021 is called Just Reasonable Multiculturalism, in which I tried to uh, make a plea that it is indeed possible to reconcile between liberalism and multiculturalism. It's one of my great books. I devoted 10 years of my life to the study of this issue. And I developed this theory of just invisible multiculturalism uh, to show that it is possible to reconcile between the two. And I wanted to take case studies for this book. And I chose two case studies. Uh, one is France and one is Israel. Both countries are, have an issue with, uh, with security. And uh, because of security considerations, they uh, undermine or dismiss the issue of multiculturalism or try to put it on a, on a lower flame. And when I had one of my lunches with Alan and I said to him, you know, I'm, I'm writing this chapter about France and there's so many things I don't understand. I simply don't comprehend what's going on there. He generously said, why don't you go there? I said, well, there's a small issue of money. And uh, he said, well, we sorted this. So they saw, well, you see, I sorted this issue of money and I went to France uh, for a field trip that helped me to understand uh, what's going on in France. So this, I wrote this chapter, it's chapter nine of Just Reason of Multiculturalism. Um, and then I continue to work on France because it's such an intriguing case. It's not what I expected at all. Um, so, um, uh, this book, the, you know, the, the one that you are coming to here today, came about. So what were the questions that troubled me when it came to France? I was intrigued why the heck the French are so obsessed with how women dress. I mean, why do you care how women dress? Um, people should dress as they want, especially if it's a liberal society. I mean, as long as you don't harm others, it's a personal thing. So why you care so much about women dress? I, I could not understand that. Um, how we can explain this obsession? Why are they obsessed only with the Muslim dress and not with other forms of dress? What's going on there? I mean, France is a multicultural society. So there are other people who dress maybe in an intriguing way or funny way or offensive way or God knows what way, why they're obsessed with the Muslim dress of all way of dresses. What makes Muslim dress so special to deserve such a close attention and treatment by the French? How can we explain those strong French sentiments designed to protect the Republic against this threat of women's dress? and how this obsession that translates into coercive laws can be reconciled with the motto, the French motto, the famous French motto of liberté, égalité, fraternité. I mean, you come to think even just on the face of it, if you deny women the right to dress as they will, well, what about their liberty? What about equality? And what about the notion of fraternity that you want to have a community? How can you create a community if you coerce people how to dress, which is you know, one of the most essential things that we do every morning. And if such coercion cannot be reconciled with the French motto, what rationalization are utilized by the French decision makers to explain negation of basic liberties, signaling out Muslim women and undermine community fraternity? So these are the questions that trouble me. And I was so troubled, I devoted time and time reading about this on, 
and I could not fathom what's going on. So I decided to go and that was enabled and it cleared many of the questions that I have. And I'm going to share you with you my insights. And it was a fascinating journey, I have to tell you that. And it was not what I expected. So what I'm going to do today in this lecture, uh, I'm going to spell out the veil controversy, explain the bit for you just as a, as, as a background, if you like, without going to too many details, but uh, just to, for you to have the background of that. I'm going to speak about the underpinning values of the French Republic, extremely important that they shape the French Republic today. I'm going to speak about um, the influence of colonialism, immigration and terrorism. Uh, all of them influence the obsession of how uh, women dress. I'm going to analyze the arguments for banning the burqa and the niqab. And I'm going to show you to what extent they, they are valid or can hold any water. So let me start by the history of that. It started in 1989 when three Muslim girls uh, came to school with, uh, with a hijab. A hijab is sort of a scarf around the, the head. And uh, um, the headmaster and the teachers did not like this. They said that there's a uniform in school. The, uni the school uniform does not include the hijab. And therefore they send them home and ask them to come back to school only without the hijab. And that created uproar because not only Muslims in that school, not to mention the three girls, but also in other schools, they, uh, they did not like the fact that this is something that negates them because they felt that the hijab is part of their identity, who they are. That's, that's how they dress. Um, that controversy was accompanied by different yet related discussion concerning school attendance of Jewish students on Shabbat, Saturday. And this was in order to show that we have nothing against the Muslim as such. It is something that we have uh, as part of the French identity of maintaining a secular public space. That's the thing, it has to be a secular public space. Um, and then at that time in 1989, the public schools were the focal point of the debate. The debate erupted and continues, it's still going on. Uh, it doesn't relax. And the main arguments against multiculturalism that is in many respects is a four letter word in France. Uh, there's very little appreciation for multiculturalism in France. They think it's contradictory to the Republic. So the claim are that um, multiculturalism is bad for democracy. It's bad for the Republic, it's bad for women and it undermines public order. So I'm going to flesh out all this argumentation and show you the logic behind this. And then hopefully I'm going to show you that uh, although the French claim that it's logical, I claim to differ. So the French Republic, that is extremely important. The notion of the Republic all stems from the French Revolution. Um, and uh, this is where um, this motto of Liberté, Egalité, Fraternité was coined. So uh, this was, this trinity, the new trinity, was contradictory, of course, to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, that's uh, contra the Catholic, Catholicism. We are now proposing a new trinity, liberal uh, trinity of liberté, égalité, fraternity. And this is going to be their republic, the French Republic, what is going to signify the French Republic. In addition to these three values, uh, one of the major uh, philosophers who influenced the, the revolution in Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and his idea of the general will. And the idea of the general will is extremely important for the understanding of the French politics even today. This is uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau in one of his, his books. The general will is the citizen body acting as a whole and freely adopting rules that apply equally to each individual. The state is the master of all goods of the community guaranteed for by the social contract, which is the basis of all rights within the state. Acts of the sovereign are just and visible because they are the making of equal citizens who share the general will. The union is as complete as it can be if we all unite together, if we all express the general will, if we all come together. This is contradictory, of course, to individual will or to atomic individual wills that do not comply with 
with uh, the public will or the general will. Article three of the Declaration of the Rights of Men and Citizens from, 97, from 1789 says that the fundamental source of all sovereignty resides in the nation. No body of men, no individual can exercise an authority which does not expressly derive therefrom. So we are who we are because of the nation. That's a very, very important principle. Article four of the declaration says that liberty consists in being able to do whatever does not harm other. So this is, if you like, the million harm principle. That's the exercise of each man's natural rights as no limits other than those which guarantee to the other members of society the enjoyment of these same rights. Those limits can only be determined by the law. Article 10 says, no man must be penalized for his opinions, even his religious opinions, provided that their expression does not disturb the public order established by law. So this is very, very important because it tells you that freedom of religion is important, but equally public order is also important. If, we, if the two clash, then there is a precedent between the two. One comes above the other, so public order precedes uh, freedom of religion. This is about liberty. Now, what about the second principle, legalité? Evolution promoted the idea of gender equality, which of course is extremely important. Men are equal to women. In that respect, it was radical at that time because you know even today, can't say that women always are equal to men. Various legislative acts accorded women unprecedented rights to equal inheritance and divorce. Again, unprecedented. So that's extremely important, um, a revolution if you like. And women certainly featured quite prominently in revolutionary protests, in photos, in placards and so on. And this is just one example. But these achievements to promote gender equality were short-lived. The practices of Republican universalism during the revolution were accompanied by statements regarding the natural gender differences which justified the exclusion of women from political citizenship. So there was one of the early uh, women philosophers of all time, uh, Olympe de Gaulle. In 1793, she published the Declaration of the Rights of Women she didn't like the fact that the declaration says, not the right of the person, but the right of men. So she published the Declaration of the Rights of Women and many people in France did not like it. Um, she had to meet the guillotine. So you can say what you like to some extent, but if you transgress this too much, you may find yourself facing the guillotine. I want to, to quote from Emile, one of the most important uh, books of Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Rousseau, I'm not going to go to into his biography, but he has complicated relationship with women, so to speak, let's put it this way, mildly so. This is a quote, men and women are made for each other, but their mutual dependence differ in degree. Man is dependent on women through his desires, women is dependent on men to her desires and also to her needs. So, Women need men, men, according to this, do not necessarily need women. He could do without her better than she can do without him. She cannot fulfill her purpose in life without his aid, without his goodwill, without his respect. She is dependent on our feelings, on the price we put upon her virtue, and the opinion we have of her charms and her deserts. Nature itself has decreed that women, both for herself and her children, should be at the mercy of men's judgment. So you can see that equality, need to wait. What about the third value, fraternity? It implies some sort of a general sense of societal cooperation. It depicts a picture in which members of society create in the spirit of the family, a common framework, both material and mental, which is necessary condition for the good life. Fraternity instructs to treat others not simply as though their rights equal to ours, 
but a loving concern for people's welfare, aiming to promote others' happiness, thus building a united family of mankind. Not mentioned, so this is the motto of uh, Liberté, Egalité, Fraternité, I'm arguing that there was a fourth principle that somehow did not enter into this trinity, possibly because they wanted to pose a trinity against the Catholic trinity. So this is there was no room for four principles. But actually, laïcité is no less important than the other three. Laïcité is secularism. And the idea of secularism is it's contra Catholicism that was coercive and perceived to be coercive. And the French Revolution wanted to free itself from the influence of the church, of the Pope, of the Vatican. Um, and the idea is that we are going to create a public space that is secular, that will, to which uh, religion is not going to enter. But how and to what extent this idea of secularism is going to be reconciled with the motto of liberté, égalité, fraternité? Does it mean that if you um, belong to a certain religion and this religion is as all kinds of faces and some of them are public, that these faces that are public has to be stay at home. It's only a private matter. So to what extent it infringes on the liberty and equality and the notion of community, if people are coerced to do something they don't like. So in order to understand how all this develops, we need to understand the values that intervene in the process, historical process of what happened with France. So one major factor, uh, factor is colonialism. At the height of the colonial era, around 1920, the French empire stretched over 11.5 million square kilometers across five continents, encompassing lands in South America, Africa, Southeast Asia, and the South Pacific. Until the close of the 19th century, French colonialism was based on assimilation, aiming to civilize its colonies, civilized men in making them as French as possible by absorbing them administratively and culturally. So you see colonies, this is a French colony in Africa, they build this small community and enshrined on them the French values. Colonialism and then later on immigration and then the feature of the third factor, which is terrorism, have shaped the present discourse on state and religion in France. That's a major argument that I'm making in this lecture. And the most important component of all the colonies that French had was Algeria that enjoyed a very special status unlike any other colony. It enjoyed a unique status as it was considered from the Second Republic onwards, not only a colony, but an integral part of France. So Algerians were able to come and stay and reside in France. And later on, they were also granted citizenship. And one of the main issues that disturbed the French colonialists was the issue of religion, and especially the foulard, the veil. They saw the veil as a sign of submission. And in order to free the women in Algeria and other parts of the colonies, the idea is that we are going to fight against the veil. We're going to, to fight against the full art. And they believe that this is going to, the, the veil is an impediment for assimilation and therefore we need to remove the veil. As you can understand, the Algerians and others did not like it very much. It's part of their, who they are. I told you about the chain, past, present, future. It's part of our identity. So that was a major call uh, in Algeria. And then later on, suddenly in the 20th century, 21st century, it appears in France, or the same thing with the same statements. You can actually compare the statement that the French made about the veil in Algeria and just copy and paste it to France. The way that they perceive their world was not very kind. One of the major philosophers of all times, Alexis de Tocqueville, wrote the following, observing Africa. He said, I must say that I emerge convinced that there are in the entire world few religions with such morbid consequences as that of Muhammad. To me, it is 
the primary cause of the now visible decadence of the Islamic world. Harsh word, harsh words. And these words strike a chord with the French leaders, the French republics throughout the ages. They understood we have an issue here with the Arab religion or the Arab culture uh, uh, that are difficult. And uh, uh, we have to reckon this, we have to do something about it. So this is the aspect of colonialism. Let me move to the second uh, aspect, which is immigration. So the French allowed um, citizens of the colonies to immigrate to France. And uh, in the 1970s, there was a large wave of immigration from especially Morocco and Tunisia. And then came other uh, countries from, from Africa, Cameroon, Ivory Coast, Mali, Senegal. Um, and facing the problems that started to emerge as they tried to assimilate these newcomers into the Republic, we see that there is a new trinity that is emerging. Indivisibilité, sécurité, and laïcité. So the first principle, the first principle of indivisibilité is to maintain the Republic. What struck me when I visited France is when I, and I talk to people, is the extent of insecurity that the French have today. 20, I, I mean, my visitation, my visit was in, in uh, 2019, but I'm, I presume nothing changed since then. They have a great sense of insecurity of maintaining the Republic. And maintaining the Republic is a value on its own. Possibly I would claim it's the most important French value. There's nothing more important in France than maintaining the Republic. The Republic is sacred and nothing should come in between that can going to split the Republic or is going to make it fall. The second is security. And this is a result of the wave of terrorism, uh, especially after September 11, that of course had offshots in the entire world, peoples all over the world, the war on terrorism. Um, there were incidents of, of terrorism before September 11, but that was the watershed in international relations and France was not excluded. And the principles that emerged from the French Revolution, the Cité, the maintaining secularism in the public space. So while the French are paying homage, I would say lip service to the original trinity of liberté, égalité, fraternité, this, truth, this new uh, trinity of universalité, sécurité, and laïcité actually is more important today in France than the trio of the revolution. You can see everywhere, liberté, égalité, fraternité, this is the motto of the Republic. You can see it uh, everywhere. Uh, as I said, there is a lip service, but actually um, the, the, the newer motto is what we, we see. So there's a, the first order principles are the traditional liberté, égalité, fraternité, the second order principles, and the visibility, security, and laïcité. And the second order principles are superimposed on the traditional motto, and clear tensions have emerged between the two sets of principles. The requirement today is clear, people should be French, leave their culture and is preferably behind or at the very least at home. The citizen does not have an identity that is independent of the state and the state is secular. Everyone is welcome provided they embrace French national republicanism with the values that I just <clears throat> mentioned in the visibility, uh, security and laicity. French republicanism is the belief in the values of the, of the public motto, liberté, égalité, fraternité, promoted and enforced by a strong state. Republicanism encapsulates the French idea. Why French today are so um, cognizant of maintaining the Republic? Well, you have to understand this is the fifth Republic. So they have the first failed, the second failed, the third failed, the fourth failed, well, this one, we don't want to fail. We don't want the sixth Republic. We have enough, you know, that's the fifth, that's the last one. So um, it's very, very important. I was under the impression that France is like England. 
that you know it's like liberalism in England is like liberalism in France. I could not be more wrong than I was. It's simply not the case. The Anglo-Saxon version of liberalism is rejected, as this means for the French majority, individualism and even atomism, privatization, a free market economy, which they don't like many of them, and multiculturalism that is some sort of four letter word because it might undermine the Republic. It's going to fragment the Republic. It's going to have different sects, different sectors competing. What about the Republic? So individual rights are important up to a point, while important they are secondary to the mm -hmm. need to keep the Republic united. What I found astonishing is that when I spoke even to experts, not experts on liberalism, okay, but experts on immigration, and experts on security, they actually didn't know what they're speaking about. Why is that? Because the French lump all the different uh, Muslim dresses into one word or two words, foulard or voal, veil. So they don't see the distinction between actually there's the hijab, there's the niqab, there's the burqa. For them, it's the veil, well, full out. And therefore, we are against the full out. Any way or shape of Muslim dress, we are against. And I was astonished that people that are supposed to deal with these communities, they speak in the name in the terms of full out without the distinction that is so important between them. So just for you to understand, that's the hijab, that's the burqa, and that's the niqab. Three forms of dresses. And the French, many of them are not aware of these differences. They think that all, when we speak about Poulard, it's this. You can't see anything. Um, I mean, the women hardly can see anything. They have a mesh through which they, they can see something, but you can see that there's no shape. Um, um, and, and that's the main thing that aggravates them. Also aggravates Boris Johnson when he's a prime minister. Um, you call them all kind of funny names. So for, for the French, that's what they see. And this is this, you agree with me, is very different from this. So subtlety, forget about it. There's no subtlety in the discussion. They're all propaganda. And of course, the French right is taking advantage of this ignorance because <clears throat> what they depict is the foulard they don't have to explain because for them, foulard is this. So the Muslim garments attracted disproportionate attention in French politics and public deliberation. Liberty of religion is restricted. Fraternity means supporting each other as long as the French way of life is accepted. And the French way of life is not full out. On 11 October 2010, France became the first European country to ban the full face Islamic veil the burqa and the niqab in public places, they do not ban the, uh, the hijab, but as I said, the ignorance is rampant. The Muslim minority in France at large feels discriminated against and marginalized. There were several polls conducted about how the French Muslim feel about all these restrictions. And 42% of Muslims in France have experienced religious discrimination at least once in their lives, Muslim women where the niqab report disturbing level of verbal abuse and sometimes physical abuse, uh, spitting on them, uh, trying to read the veil and so on. My question is my new set of questions after the law. Is this law socially just? Does it reasonably balance the preservation of societal <clears throat> values and freedom of conscience? And I was especially intrigued after 2019, I thought, that now that this COVID came about in 2020, 2021, so many of us are wearing some sort of face coverage. I mean, what's the big difference between my face coverage and the niqab? Not great difference. I mean, with my, you'll see what my eyes, some of my cheeks, it's not that different from the niqab. So I thought maybe this is going to provoke some attention to the friend and say, well, actually, you know, all this hoo-ha that we've done from the Muslim dress is not that important. Now, all of us were in the niqab more or less because of health issues. 
No. 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 For the French, health is one thing, religion is another thing. Health is accepted, religion is not. Not in a public space. You want to wear the niqab at home, you're free to do that, but it's not on the street. Street has to be um, free of this kind of things they sit in. So I came to analyze in the book, I, I collected all the arguments against uh, the Muslim dress, the obsession, what I call the obsession, all the arguments for the ban, for the 2010 ban. And I tried to look at them to what extent actually they ring true to me, to my logic, limited logic. And I, in the book, I detailed them one for one. So the first one is that the foulard is the enemy of indivisibility, the French unity, and of Muslim emancipations. Because so the arguments go, these garments relegate women to an inferior status incompatible with the French ideas of equality and the dignity of <clears throat> the person. Okay, fine. That's what you think about them. So these poor women are coerced to wear this garment. Let's look at the research. I am interested in figures. I want to know. There was widespread coercion. Okay, so we have a problem. I looked everywhere trying to find information about this. Very limited. I found far more information about women protesting against the ban, Muslim women, than women says that, oh, thank you very much, France, for liberating me. All I got are complaints of Muslim women. Why do you force me to be free? I don't want to be forced to be free. This is part of who I am. It's part of my identity. You're breaking me, you're breaking my soul. You're breaking who I am. What kind of a liberty is that? Ask me, do I want it, do I don't want it? Why you decide for me what I want? That's what I found, that's what the research found. And the second thing, you want to maintain public order and peace and the Republic by this ban. But actually, do you? Does the ban lessen the friction between the Muslims and the, um, and the Christians? Or does it increase friction by the ban? And the result is without any doubt, it increases friction. So if you want to maintain the Republic, the last thing that you'd want to do is to coerce people to wear something that they don't like. Second argument is public health believe it or not. Why? Because it's heavy. They smell. Really? Really? I mean, you're really concerned about public health. You know, I'm more concerned with this, for instance, far more concerned with this. What is does to your body? What is does to your bones? What it does to your spine? I'm very much concerned with the steel talk then I'm worried about the book. If you want to think about public health, now why don't you speak about the steel toe? And not to mention the little black dress, freezing night to go out and about like this. This is public health. I mean, such cold nights, this is what they need on Friday night. Why are you doing concern about this? What about smoking, vaping, consuming alcohol, sunbathing, artificial time powers, watching disturbing films that lead to sleep deprivation, professional boxing, the consumption of fatty food? What about banning McDonald's? Why are you not concerned about all these things? Only the burqa is the issue of public health? What's going on here, dear French people? I don't get you. Why you are so obsessed with the French dress, not the Muslim dress, French Muslim dress. And this one I found extremely funny. The burqa and the niqab cause sensory deprivation and vitamin D deficiency. Yeah, that's the main cause why we need to put a ban on the burqa 
and the nikab because of vitamin D deficiency. I persuaded. Another intriguing argument is that supports terrorism. So there were a couple of incidents. I tried to find information about it. There were a couple of incidents in which terrorists uh, were dressed up like women, uh, were in the burqa, and they went out to explode or to do terrorist stunts. So they used the burqa as a, as a facade, um, which is disturbing, I presume. But, and, and, and you know, uh, Charlie Hebdo, you, the upper one million people in the Bastille and so on, uh, promoting freedom of speech and opposing terrorism. Um, but the fact that a dress is used and abused in different ways does not justify banning the dress. I mean, if this is what you want, some of the terrorists were carrying kitchen knives. Are you going to ban kitchen knives? Because it might be abused for terrorist aspects. Or what about chemistry books that we used in order, they use in order to prepare some bombs? What about motorcycle helmets that they use for terrorism? And what about using the telephone? Are you going to ban the telephone? I promise you, they use the telephone to concoct some of their activities. And of course, they use the internet. Are you going to, to ban the internet as well? So all these arguments, it's red herring. They, it's, these are not the reasons why they don't like it. Another intriguing one is that it's offensive. So if a woman wearing burqa in the street, I am the French, I'm offended by this. And I actually saw videos in which regular citizens on the street and politicians, of course, came out and said, I'm offended by a woman who wears the burqa. Well, my response is, it is your problem. It's not the women's problem, it's your problem, deal with that. I mean, people are offended with all kinds of stuff. Many people are offended by the fact that women shout order on men. Some deeply offended by two men holding hands, not to mention kissing each other. Or two women holding hands, not to mention kissing each other. I mean, we're offended by all kinds of stuff. Deal with that. It's not their problem, it's your problem. They do no harm to you. Now, I'm not saying that there's no logic in claiming offense. I actually wrote about offense quite extensively. I'm not dismissing the idea of offense, but I said that offense to sensibility argument will take precedence over freedom of religion only in cases where profound and direct damage is inflicted upon the sensibility of individuals, undermining dignity, especially when the door's intentions are to offend the individuals under circumstances in which individuals cannot avoid. So many of the factors here, the criteria here, are simply missing when it comes to the way Muslim women dress. I can't say that they have profound damage to their sensibilities. It does not undermine the dignity of other people. The French claim maybe undermine the dignity of women, but I said, this is doubtful. And there's no intention to offend anybody. The only intention is to practice their religion to preserve their own dignity. They don't want to be under the gaze of men. Let me look at the philosophy of Simone de Beauvoir, one of the leading French philosophers and one of the leading feminists of all time. She criticized the tendency of protecting women against their inner weaknesses attributed to them by men. Criticized men for dictating to women what to do criticize women who accept the status as the other, not the most important part of society, but the other in society and who are complacent towards men. De Beauvoir protested against the French tendency, very much in the spirit of Rousseau's Emile, to see good in whatever pleases men, serving their needs, happiness, freedom, and the progression of men's life, and that see evil in everything that hampers those needs. Women should be responsible for themselves. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, men. We don't need you. My argument is that the ban on the burqa and the niqab undermines the agency of women it claims to emancipate in the name of the contextualized sexist and colonialist conception of French Republican <laughs> autonomy. It is counterproductive because it might exacerbate the defensive assertion 
of patriarchal norms. So we are talking about freedom of religion. If there is a religion in France, it is laicite. Secularism is the religion. And secularism supersedes all other principles. In the, in the Jean-Jacques Rousseau spirit, French forces people to be free. And people are not free to follow their religious convictions as they wish as a result. As if this is not bad enough, there were several episodes around the French Riviera, there's the Knis and others, in which municipalities ban the burkini. Burkini is the women, the Muslim women dress when they go into the sea. Spot the differences, you know, like in the newspaper, sometimes you have spotted differences. Uh, there's one uh, swimsuit and the other is burkini. Which one is which one? Clearly, there's something behind all this reasoning. That's not that. The ban on the burqa and the niqab is wrong in principle, is counterproductive and illiberal. It fails to respect freedom of religion, which is a basic human rights. The burkini debate is just ridiculous. Let me conclude. Le Cité is the product of religious wars, colonialism, statism, and nation building. Any dissent is deemed to be dangerous, divisive, threatening, and challenging. The ban rewards freedom of religion, and it offends the dignity of women who voluntarily opt to wear this garment for religious reasons in order to keep their modesty intact and also to protect themselves from strangers who might make them feel uncomfortable. Marianne and Jeanne d'Arc are symbols of French women who fight for freedom. The statues adorn the streets of major French cities. And by the way, sometimes Marianne is covered with, surprise, surprise, veil. Veiled status of the Holy Virgin features in many churches. Time will tell if France will be able to renew the true spirit of liberté, Egalité, fraternité, and have on the street statues of veiled women who fought for these same values by preserving their religion, their freedom of choice, and their dignity. I want to dedicate this lecture to Professor Jack Hayward. Jack was a colleague and a friend. He passed away a couple of years ago. And he introduced me to the French debates and the French Republic. Um, and all the French issues. He was a French scholar. He studied France uh, he, uh, all his life. Uh, so I want to de dedicate this lecture to him, uh, to the mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, uh, uh, Raphael. Uh, I am um... I'm very proud and very pleased that the UCL Centre for Ethics and Law was able to uh, provide uh, some material support for your work uh, and continue to do so. Uh, I've got a, a quite a long script that was uh, sent in by, by Catherine Ultra, uh, uh, again, apologizing that she, she couldn't be here. I was just gonna pick out a few pieces from it uh, and then um, open uh, the uh, discussion to the floor to find out what comments people might have and questions, uh, bearing in mind that we need to finish very soon. Uh, Catherine, um, well, before Catherine goes on, I just uh, uh, want to mention one point. As you know, um, when you become a French citizen, your ancestors become Asterix and Vercingetorix uh, and that is your, uh, the history that you inherit. Uh, it's uh, a, a, um, a strange uh, fact, but true. The uh, uh, other element, going back to what Catherine actually says, she says that there's a strange parallel uh, in that you have in, uh, say, uh, Iran, um, you have a requirement that you um, uh, uh, wear um, a, uh, a very full uh, uh, headscarf covering your hair and uh, Islamic dress. Um, and women there are um, in revolt um, and burning their shadows. Uh, you have in Afghanistan, the uh, 
uh, uh, the oppression of, of, of women and the requirement that they, uh, they again, wear a um, very full uh, uh, Islamic dress all the way through to uh, uh, niqabs and beyond burqas. Uh, and then you have uh, uh, the issues that uh, uh, that Raphael raised um, in in France uh, in terms of banning this in the public in the public sphere. Um, Catherine goes on um, to to say that um, she traces us back to 1905, to as well Raphael, uh, and the the conflict, um, the resolution of the conflict between church and state, and. Uh, where you have uh, the, the privatization of religion, uh, where it's excluded from the, the public sphere. Uh, uh, and uh, she traces, as the Raphael traces, uh, the, the changes in, in uh, French perception all the way through from, well, from the revolution, but certainly through from 1905. Uh, she also um, highlights the, the point that um, uh, the, there's called it the need for conformity uh, uh, is seen as important because um, uh, non-conformity in the public sphere is seen as a threat to the nation and uh, uh, the French republics um, have been very focused on terms of nation building and uh, preserving the nation. Uh, the, uh, uh, she goes on to say that um, uh, the, the, the role of the citizen in France is, uh, is to build the nation and to reinforce the nation. And uh, that is reason why you as a citizen uh, should conform, um, which includes adopting um, uh, uh, French history, no matter uh, what your background is. Uh, multiculturalism, uh, as Raphael said, is a, is a threat uh, 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 to that, uh, the state and leads to fragmentation in certainly in the public sphere. Uh, the, um, it, it's also interesting that uh, uh, Catherine draws a, a parallel between the, the work of uh, uh, Kemal Ataturk in, uh, uh, in uh, forming the, the, the nation state of Turkey um, after the, uh, the breakup of the fragmentation of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, and the, the adoption of, uh, of Western dress, never mind um, Latin script, uh, and Western styles of education uh, in, and, and banning uh, forms of Islamic dress, including headscarves and uh, uh, the fez, as being um, uh, too oriental in his perception. Uh, the, um, uh, again, you can see the, the, uh, the the, this called the conformity, the parallelism uh, between France. She, uh, she also talks about the importance of, uh, uh, of uh, fear, fear of uh, people who are different, uh, but that's not peculiar to France. Uh, she talks about the issues of identity politics, again, not peculiar to France, but also um, the uh, France being uh, in many ways a very centralized state, in some ways parallel to this country, um, and including the suppression of regional languages. Um, in, in France. Uh, the, um, again, uh, this probably doesn't do justice to all the points that Catherine's made, but uh, uh, she uh, draws the point that uh, the French Revolution um, had a number of purposes behind it, um, but part of that is to promote um, uh, rights, but these are political rights, not, not individual rights. Um, and uh, uh, the, the revolution itself was less concerned with, uh, let's call it civil and personal freedoms, uh, other than they, that ones that emerged in, uh, let's call it, uh, as a result of uh, the, uh, the granting of political rights. Uh, she, um, she draws a, a parallel um, between uh, 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 French concepts of uh, secularism uh, and authoritarianism uh, and uh, the authoritarian of modern culture. And um, the, um, again, the, it's called it the continuing work in progress of, of nation building. Again, not peculiar to, to France in many ways. And finally, uh, uh, in terms of her key points, um, 
she uh, uh, again says that the the power of secularism and um, can only really be understood as a, a mirror image of the uh, uh, response to uh, Catholicism in in the French context and uh, the creation of secularism as a state religion within France uh, to act as a uh, an opposing pole to uh, uh, the let's call it the Catholic grip on uh, uh, on society, particularly in education and conformity. Two types of conformity: secularism and Catholicism as different forms of uh, conformity in the interests of building and maintaining a nation state. I'll stop at that point. I probably have not done uh, um, justice at all to what Catherine was uh, would have liked to have said, but uh, hopefully given her, uh, some flavour of uh, the points that she would like to have made. I was going to open it to, to the floor at this point to take questions. If you can just say who you are and your affiliation, that would be very useful. So I think I have the first question over here and then one at the back there. Yes. Uh, my name is Andrew Cox and I don't have an affiliation. I've worked for an organisation called the UK UK and I um, involved with a very short introduction to secularism in the early peace So mm. I think on secularism a lot. Um, I completely agree with everything you've said about the fundamentally liberal nature of the band um, that we're discussing. But I don't, I'm not sure you've been completely fair to the argument about uh, gender equality. And I, I wondered why you made the lack of coercion um, the test of whether or not women were being undermined in, in gender equality terms by wearing the veil or not. Because you don't have to be coerced to do something um, before you're doing it to be undermining your uh, gender equality. Um, you could be doing it of your own free will, but still it's doing you a great harm. So are you, are you saying because we're good liberals, we should let people do harm to themselves? And in which case, how do you square that liberal uh, approach to whether or not women should be allowed to their birth with your wider points about the value of Okay. Do you want to address that yeah. one and then we'll take the next question? It, it, Andrew, it's a very good question. And it, it's a question that troubled me a great deal. I have to say that. Um, what's the. I um, I tried to find information, and there are some videos that, that I could find of uh, Muslim women uh, and research about Muslim women, uh, the way they dress and why they're dressing like this. Um, so the main reason that that women dress like the way they dress is uh, twofold. One is because of religion, so that's a, a way of they identifying with the religion. But that's who they are. That's how they were brought up and so on. And the second is that there is element of um, the relationship with, with the other, with the public, especially men outside the house. Um, so if we go according to French logic, and we are not going to allow the book, and there's a ban as, as it is now from 2010. So, um, Buka and Niqab are no-no in France. In certain religious families in France, if you're a Muslim, and you cannot wear the Buka or the Niqab in public, that means that these women are confined to their home. They can't go out. They can't go out because uh, some people don't allow them to go out or because they don't feel comfortable enough to go out. And I can't judge between the two. I mean, it's mixed back, so how would I know? But actually, if you want to liberate women, to enable them to go out, then the, if that's what you want, then, then you have to do that. One of the things that um, I'm always, I studied for the other book that I mentioned, uh, um, Just Visible Multicultural, I studied all kinds of practices, cultural practices and so on. And many of them have to do with women, unfortunately, because they're all whims of men that apply to, to women. Um, so one of the things that intrigued me the most is female circumcision. And um, what I discovered in the research that many women want to go under, uh, undergo female circumcision. You ask yourself why? Why do they want to undergo this? I mean, it's painful to them. Why, why do they want this? Um, it is because everyone does it and the men are not involved. It's all the women. It's the mother, it's the auntie, it's the sister. 
it's a group of women that all of them, and that's how they, they talk to the girl from a very young age, because usually it's conducted between the age of nine to 16. So I call this internalized coercion, okay? I can't call it coercion. It's the part of their psyche, it's part of their identity. And if it's internalized to the fact that you accept this as who you are, what is more damaging? That I come from the outside, like a bull in a China store, and I'm going to tell you, you should not do that. And then you break your relationship with your family, your friends, anybody you're belonging, because she will have to leave. And where she, does she have to leave? She's a young girl. If she wants to maintain, and you know, family is very important to us, the majority of us, family is extremely important. I would say that the majority of us, family is probably the most important value that we have in our life. What's the options? So when it comes that you internalize coercion to the fact that you accept something that you should not accept, coercing from the outside, I would say many times it's even more harmful. In, in female genital mutilation, you make the same argument? No, no. I draw the line. You have to read the, the, the read the book. When, <laughs> it come, when it comes to torture, I'm very much against torture. But when it comes to, you know, that's, I'm in Israel, okay? So um, once upon a time, I lived in Israel, many years of my life. Um, so I studied the, the way that um, female circumcision is, is practiced in bed, by Bedouins in Arabs in Israel. That's why I went. And what he found out that all they do in the Bedouin tribes is a scar on the outer labia of the women. Now, how do I compare this scar to male circumcision? I would say the male circumcision is cutting with the penis. It's more harmful to the, to the men, to the boys, than to the girl, I would say. Um, so this is, it was some sort of a lip service to traditional culture and, um, and paying homage to the, to, to, to the tradition. And at the same time, it's not a major thing that is going to harm them for the entire life. So I draw a line from female circumcision we've done for tradition that is not damaging the way of life to torture, which is female genital mutilation. I am a liberal but I'm also believing in some sort of a balance. I'm trying to find, to reconcile between liberalism and multicultural and to reconcile between individual rights and group rights. And it's a very complex issue and you have to draw a balance. I'm not saying that my logic would be acceptable by anybody. I mean, uh, I met feminists and fierce arguments with feminists who said that I'm, um, I'm aligned harm to women. Okay, I, I cannot argue uh, about this too much, but I can say, that I do my utmost, sincere utmost effort to balance between group rights and individual rights. Question over there. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah, Peter Kay, I pretended to teach philosophy for some years at York University and New York University here in London, and I pretend to write popular philosophy books, but they're never quite as popular as Katie Price's books. Um, I enjoyed your talk, particularly the idea that maybe McDonald's should be banned. I could approve of that. Um, suppose there's a particular group, a minority group of men, perhaps they belong to the phallus society in Paris, and they like wandering around in Paris naked, or more or less naked, just attired in socks with erect penises. Lots of people are offended by this. Would you be inclined to say, well, they ought not to be offended? Or would you be inclined to say, well, maybe people could have a vote on this issue in a de democratic society, which you claim to support? And if they then, if the vote is such to pass a law, such that everybody is equal before the law, which you also say you support, but the law actually bans um, men going around with erect penises more or less naked, then is there anything wrong with equally so it ending up having a law which actually prevents um, the burqa in public? Well, you, you draw some sort of similarity between the burqa and, and uh, going naked. Um, I'm intrigued by the fact that you picked only men. Why did you well, pick only men? Because the burqa replies on its women. So <laughs> okay, I mean, well, I... don't I, mind picking women if you want. Race. No, I, I, I'm, 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 for, I'm, I'm egalitarian. So yes, if you say women and men go naked on the streets, all of us go naked in the streets. We have a movement of going naked. We'll have a public health... Would be Islamic style. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, they, they, they are issues that I think differentiate between Boca and going naked on the street. I think they are different. Uh, people tend to be quite squeamish when it comes to, um, to naturalists. And I believe, again, in 
in in in a sense of you know you can do your own things but don't impose yourself on others. Uh, so if you do separate beach, beaches to, to naturalists, I have no problem with that, as long as you, you, you do it in a way that doesn't deeply offend others. I think the depth of the offense is different. Um, uh, I'm not a psychologist. I, I think that going with the book or going naked, I think the level of the offense, I, I studied offense. I don't know whether you're familiar with Joy Fanda, who wrote the book, Offense to Others. Um, and he gives serious consideration to the issue of, uh, of nudity and how offensive it might be to some people. And I see the way that some people actually uh, react to nudity. Um, um, you know, it, it, it can be quite vile in their response. So I think that some people are really, really offended by it. I cannot draw the comparison between that and the, and the book, I'm sorry. I mean, it's a nice political, philosophical exercise and it's a very nice exercise to do it to students to, to examine to what extent young people um, agree with you or not, uh, philosophically, but I think there is a difference between the two. My, my wife, for example, kills deeper things I've seen in the birth of her couple. Yes. I'm not sure what your grounds are, the same one is deeper than the other. Yeah. Yeah. In one group, we've got like, two questions in view of time. Should you just take the two questions? Um, there's one over here and there's one right from there. You have a question? Yes, I will. used to be Rafi's colleague, so that's true. Um, so great, thanks very much, Rafi, for the stuff that you digest. I just wondered if I could be a tiny bit of a devil's advocate for some of the flavor of French, which was going away before in my life. Uh, uh, I mean, just uh, I think there's a lot, uh, there's a lot of negotiation I think you could have about the public private um, issue. And I think you, you could say the street is, you, you know, you could put that in different places and the, the general. French thesis would be more or less plausible, depending on where you draw that line. And the, the uh, Americans, you know, the, the American liberalism has, you know, there is a public, it, it, there are public spaces which are, you know, universities and schools, but there's a, quite a limited range of things which, which count as public space, uh, but not the street. And it's much more reasonable there. So here's a quick anecdote. Um, I remember in the 90s in Turkey, which is relevant. Was capital uh, when it was more of a Kamal Kamalist um, talking to two uh, academics about the ban on the, of the headscarf, in just on university campuses. And, and I was shocked by these very you know, nice. Westernized, left leaning liberal people defending, uh, banning the headscarf on campus, not generally, just on campus. And so I expressed my you know, natural liberal sentiments. And they came back and said, no, no, you just don't understand um, that if, um, and they made a connection, if you allow, if you allow that, then there's a very short track to um, cafes being bombed during Ramadan. <laughs> so, um, so there's a, a causal connection, or at least it's a, a, a bundle of things which go together. And if you allow this in the public space in that way, then the consequences will be very illiberal for people who don't necessarily want to do um, people who want to eat during the daytime in Ramadan. <coughs> um, so, you know, if you so first of all negotiate in the right way, you could just retreat quite a bit over what counts as the, the public space. Maybe just universities. I mean, I'm shocked when my kids in the state school had to participate in an activity. I mean, I feel American about that. I mean, why should they have an activity? Why should they have to dress up as baby Jesus in the state school, especially when 50% okay. That's not nice. <laughs> so, but it just seems uh, inappropriate in certain contexts. So I think the streets is one thing. So some nego a bit of negotiation. There's a, there's a range of theories you could have, uh, depending on where you put that boundary. Mm. Uh, and then it's not, the French position is not that implausible as, uh, in certain cases, if you think there is a connection between uh, a negative, uh, allowing, um, allowing this display in the public context and some illiberal consequence. So it's a bit of that. 
Like, final question. Thank you, Raj. Hi, I'm Rasha from the University of Manchester State. You've concentrated every time on bail for the not mentioned other elements of laicite, uh, which include not wearing a cross in public, yeah. which include not wearing it like in David or a uh, or or any other form um, of, of religious observance. And I just wonder whether it would help in terms of understanding uh, French position or at least making it seem just a little bit more sensitive if one looks at the other things that they've done. Um, is there any similarity in relation to these other issues? Uh, or is it really that they're only going for the burqa and the niqab and they just have to say the same thing? <coughs> else? Is that what you're suggesting? Um, or is laicite, secularity, really something which is so important to them that they're prepared to do this for all religions, including one which is dear to many French, even the secularism is important, so is Catholicism, and so is some Protestantism. Um, so I, I don't know whether in ignoring all of that, you um, you allow yourself to deal with just one particular issue or make that the only thing that ever you do. And I don't mind either way, which is what you're going for. Um, I can just as a final, um, you, you don't mention at all and I think it's a possibility, because I think it was true in this country, that many Muslim women who did not wear Muslim dress at one point in their lives suddenly did as a, not just a religious, but also a, a political context, which I have no problem with, but it is different from what you are saying. Yeah. Can I just pick up this one final, final question? Um, Thank you. Go ahead. Um, thank you, Raphael. So I really enjoyed your talk. What's your name? I'm Baron Ogo. I'm a reading for Sophia at Brunel University. Okay. Um, as I say, I enjoyed your talk. And I've got questions that look something like this. What's the scope of your second order principles? One response might be it's public debate in France. That's fine. Another response could be to policy in France. But perhaps a broader answer looks something like you began in a place where you were amazed about how different France was. But if all of a sudden you say these are differences of degrees, not kinds, because you have parallel debates in several countries across the world, debates about handshaking, for example, citizenship that they refuse to people who refuse to shake hands with. Um, with, with the officials and immigration ceremonies. If you look at more broadly what's happening across Europe, if you look at sales or book sales of what's that famous French book, um, Submission Outside of France, all of a sudden you can begin to see that perhaps these second order principles might not only focus on public debate in France, or culture in France, but perhaps more broadly. And so I was wondering about the scope. So there you've got two defences of France, including the wider one, and then a question which opens out the debate to saying that there's actually no real French exceptionism. Okay, let me answer. Let's start with Nick. Um, the example that you gave is a slippery slope example, uh, and I have a problem with slippery slope arguments and so on, uh, because they they stretch the debate too much to my, yeah. I mean, if you start like this, then you, you end with nothing. It's a slippery slope. It's a slippery slope. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So just to, to give an analogy, uh, someone is disturbed by a lady chatterly lover, and then he will disturb by erotica literature, and then he will be disturbed. Well, yeah, okay, so they are going to make causal claim that, uh, let me just finish that. So uh, someone is disturbed by Lady Chatterley lovers, and then you're disturbed by 
erotica literature and then disturbed by pornography. And then he claims that pornography is violent and then he claims that there's violence against women uh, by men that is created by Lady Chatterley Lover, which is, I would say, gross uh, stretch, uh, but to put it mildly, okay? So I have a problem with, with, uh, with the slippery slope argument. Again, it's a philosophical exercise, but I don't think it's significant, I'm sorry to say. About the nativity, I can tell you that when my son uh, was asked to participate in nativity, he asked to see the headmistress. And we had a discussion. I explained to her that my son is a Jewish and uh, we don't believe in Jesus for the time being. Uh, so uh, if she can allocate to him to do something else, I'll appreciate that. And he would appreciate that. So she allocated him music. He sang. So it was better to sing than to be part of nativity that he doesn't believe in and so on. Uh, so it was fine. Uh, that's, that's not the issue. Avum, you have excellent questions. I love your questions uh, because your question also troubled me. I mean, it is your question were my questions. Uh, I have answers all this in the book. I mean, this, this is limited, especially when I have such a stringent chair who was watching the, the watch and all the time and so on. Uh, I, can't, I can't cover all these issues that I can tell you, yes, but, be but it's in the book. But what I want to tell you is that La Cité harms predominantly Muslim, far more than any other religion. Jews. Well, first of all, we don't wear huge stars of David on our chest. It's this most of the time, or this most of the time, and the French don't care about us, as they don't care about small crosses. Um, so the other problem is kippa. But what Jews do, Orthodox Jews do, they wear hats. Hats are fashionable, especially in Paris. All kinds of feathers, you know, all kinds of hats. Like you could be extravagant with hats. Sold, sorted, no issue, whatever. Hijab in schools. I had a meeting with the vice, like the board of deputies, they have similar thing. I went to the vice president. I asked him, how do you deal with that? You have Orthodox Jews here. Well, I mean, they don't come without the department. They, they can't do that. I'm talking young, young kids. They must work the part if you're orthodox. How do you deal with that? He said, easy. We established Jewish schools, private schools, private schools that French don't touch it. I said, okay, so the Muslims can do the same. Yes, it's going to take them some years, 50 years from now. They have to have the money, the resources, the zeal, the, the energy to do that and so on. How many actually Muslim schools are in France? Very few. Some, some people tell me that you can count them on my two hands, and that's it in the entire France. You see discriminatory discriminant against Muslim. The Muslim is the problem. And I told you, I gave quotes from Alexis de Tocqueville. I explained that this persecution of the Foulard started already in the colonialist time. I was staggered that when I read colonialist literature, they had the same argumentation. That we are going to emancipate the women there. They are going to remove the hijab. They become French in Algeria. They become us. We are going to liberate them. Were they successful in liberating them? Go to Algeria to see to what extent you liberated them after all your efforts. You just crushed them and you caused the war, bloody war between you and them. For years, it cost thousands of lives. You are unable to crush religion. You cannot crush religion. You have to find a way to religion. You have to create bridges, not walls. And crushing is not a policy. So I'm telling you, it's not about creating laicite and free space for all. It's something that have to do with Islam. When I was hinting, when I met liberal scholars and asked them, is there anything behind this? Some were courageous enough to tell me, yes, there is. I said, what is it? They said the word. Racism, many French would not admit that. It's certainly not in public. If they are admitted in public, there will be an uproar and they will be outcast. This woman said, those who told me, the women who told me that, 
They said, please don't quote me on that. Okay. But they mentioned the name. So it works on Muslim. The other find solutions. Muslims have a problem in France. Um, I think there's obsession there. I think there's an obsession there. And it's not, it did not start with Muslims, it started with Catholicism. Uh, you look back at the 18th, 19th century, it started with a fight against Catholicism. The French don't like any kind of competition to Frenchness. And when it competes with Frenchness, once upon a time it was the Pope, now it's Muhammad or presentation of Muhammad or Islam, they have a problem with that. So that's the issue. And it is an obsession about this thing. There's no obsession about the kippah. There's obsession about Muslim dress. Lastly, about your questions. Yes, the phenomenon is broad and you're right. Other countries in Europe also don't like the burqa and the niqab. I think it stems from the same sentiments. The sentiments are, is that we have a large wave of immigration, of Muslim immigration to Europe and some elements in Europe do not like it and some populist figures in politics in these countries are using this as a card in order to upgrade themselves in the political arena. This is what happening. So that's the root cause. Europe has an issue with immigration from our worlds. There is a competition on what there is on the public space. And many Europeans fear that this competition is not going to fare well with them. That's the issue. On that note, thank you very much. Um, and um, <laughs> we'll draw things to close, but thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for the great questions and uh, safe journey home.